Finally, I can sit down comfy too. Uh, please put your laptops away. All right, thanks to whoever put that chair here. <coughs> All right, a few logistic things. So, um, first thing is the Kaggle competition seems to be going strong. People are doing extremely well, a little bit too well, actually. So several people, at least three times, three teams have 100% accuracy on the test set. Oh, I guess we do clean our uh, baby. <laughs> yeah, that's an XKCD dog. And one thing that seems very suspicious, uh, one team gets 100% accuracy just after one try. So I don't know how that is possible. That's not how the world works usually. So either you're extremely lucky, <laughs> or there might have been some tip. <laughs> um, I don't know what that means, but I can read this part, TensorFlow. Oh, you shouldn't click on this. Um, okay, but yeah, so basically, please, everybody who does, hasn't submitted yet, you know, it seems like there's actually a very easy way to move up your grade. So, so don't, don't let this, uh, you know, don't waste this opportunity. Um, I talked to some students what they're doing. It's very, very interesting. So that's, you know, they're really using the tricks they learned here. So that's really awesome. <laughs> so then there's a new homework assignment out, a new project. And so someone actually asked, aren't there two more projects? And the answer is yes. There's two more projects. Um, <laughs> one person is excited. So, but don't worry. So that there's project seven, which is car trees. And that is amongst the more challenging ones. So please take that very seriously. That was pushed out yesterday. So what you have to implement there is, and I just bring it up here. No, that's the other one. Here, car trees. So you actually have to basically implement trees and then you have to, you know, you visualize just a normal car tree on a data set. Then you have to implement bagging. This here is bagging. And you see the error as the error goes down. So this here is number of iterations that you bag for. Uh, training and testing error. And then you have to implement boosting. And so here you see the testing error go down as you keep boosting and the training error. In this case, on this data set, actually boosting outperforms bagging by quite a bit. And you can visualize the decision boundary of boosting. So you have to implement card trees, you have to implement bagging, and you have to implement boosting. Um, add a boost thereof. So getting card trees dry take a little bit of time. I actually revamped the whole assignment. This last time the feedback was this assignment was too hard. So I made it easier this time. So it's only regression trees. But, and uh, in particular, if you've done the homework, then you should have actually had, you know, done all the math that you need to do to implement these regression trees efficiently. So, you know, it's basically what you did in the homework, just implement that. So it shouldn't be that hard. When you're done with this, you know, take a well-deserved break of an hour and then switch over to the next project. <laughs> and that uh, will be what we cover starting very, very soon. That will be the next topic. The next project eight is very easy. So I'm not just saying this, it really is very, very easy. Right? It's kind of like, remember the per uh, Perceptron uh, project? It's easier than the Perceptron project. Right? So it should only take you an hour or two hours. So just don't leave it until the last minute in case something goes wrong, but you should easily be able to do it in a couple. So we will only give you a week to do it, but you should easily be able to do it. It's really not hard. <clears throat> All right, so then a few more things. So, you know, a few weeks ago we did this midterm evaluation, and at the end I asked you, what, is, what do you still want to cover? And, you know, so people put in all sorts of things. So here's a list of things you wanted to see. There's a deep learning, deep learning, deep learning, deep learning, deep learning, deep learning, neural nets, neural nets, neural nets. And I have the feeling you tried to tell me something. <clears throat> so, um, I decided to <laughs> last. The last couple of lectures is actually all along. This is deep learning, deep learning, deep learning, deep learning. At some, you know, finally at the end, someone says kernels. <laughs> <laughs> so it's a tie. <laughs> <laughs> uh, 
But I decided to go with deep learning because it came first. Um, so what I want to do today is actually, I want to finish up boosting. And in fact, what I will do, I actually have, if you look at the notes, there's a lot of stuff that we haven't covered yet. Um, but a lot of it is just derivations. So it's actually, the high level is quite, in, quite simple. And you just read through the derivations. So what I did is I actually added a lot more description uh, in the lecture notes. And I just trust you that you read through it. And if you do this deal, that you read through the lecture notes carefully and you make sure you understand the derivations, then I don't have to do the derivations in the lecture, which is kind of boring anyway. Like, there's not that much value in going through it in the lecture and you just, because you often lose half the audience. Um, and then we can just move on today. So let me briefly go over the lecture notes and just tell you, because you have to do it for, you have to know it for the project. So remember last time we basically talked about boosting and then we, in boosting, okay, uh, where are we? We basically add, you know, uh, sorry, let me just go to the very first equation here. Okay, we basically have a, a classifier that basically is a sum of many different classifiers and we have to, at every single iteration, we add, you know, we have our previous classifier, capital H, and we add a little weak learner, little h. And when we solve this, what we realize is what we have to minimize is the inner product of this little h with the gradient of the last function. And so then we went to two different uh, case settings. The first one was gradient boosting. We did this two lectures ago. And last time we did adder boost. And adder boost, we did two things. So A, we performed a line search. So if you remember this, uh, let me just go through this. We're trying to minimize this function. This here is my function. This here is the minimum. And I'm at some point here, this is my current h. And I get a gradient information which is basically, you know, pointing downhill that function. And then I get a weak learner that is aligned with this gradient information. So I try to approximate this with a weak learner. It's not going to be great. So let's say it points a little bit off. And then what I do in Ada Boost is I, you know, I don't just have a small step size. I don't just take a small step. Instead what I'm doing is I try to go as fast, as, you know, exactly the, the longest step to minimize my function. That's so if I look at this, this slice through here, what's the minimum value of the objective function? And because the objective function is convex, I can actually solve it in closed form. And in particular because of the exponential loss. So I jump right here, right? And then I can basically now go and take the next step. So that's one of the reasons why Adaboost converges so quickly. And uh, turns out if you solve for this, if you basically say, what's the best alpha? So here's, here's the optimization problem. I try to find the alpha such that if I add my weak learner with that step size, I'm minimizing the loss. Right? So that's basically this equation here. And if I go through this math, and it's relatively straightforward, it's just, it's just algebra, then what I see that actually at the end, alpha is one half log one minus epsilon over epsilon. But epsilon is the weighted error. Right? And that is beautiful because that means we don't really have to do anything. Right? So typically when you try to find the right step size, what you do is you try many, many different step sizes and pick the minimum. In this case, we don't have to do this. You get this magical equation that tells us exactly this is the perfect step size for this particular weak learner with this error. Right? It's amazing. It just takes as input the, the weighted error and out comes the, the optimal step size. And this gives rise to, um, to the, the following algorithm. So this here is Adaboost. And this is exactly what you have to implement in the project. And you see, now you can see why it became so popular. It made everybody go crazy when it came out, because it's just a few lines of code, right? So let's just quickly walk through it. So you start out initially, you have the zero prediction. And the WI, this is the weight of every single point. So you give every one of your training points the same weight. It's just one over n. And then what you do is you say, I'm calling my weak learner that minimizes my error approximately of my data set, x1, y1 to x and yn, with, and this is a typo here, this should be wn, with, with these weights. So basically I have a weighted version of my data set. Every single data point has a weight. And my algorithm, my weak learner algorithm, takes as inputs these weights and gives me a weak learner for this weighted uh, data set. And then all I need to do is I compute the weighted error. So I look at all the points that I get wrong and I sum up their weights. So that's basically the fraction of weight that I got wrong. And <coughs> 
If that's, if that's greater than one half, then I stop because that means, that actually it can never be greater than one half, then I can just flip the predictions, right? So, but it can be exactly one half up to machine, machine precision, then I'm toast. But as long as it's less than one half, that means on average I'm doing a little better than random. That, that's my requirement, right? So you have to have a weak learner that on average, or that, that, sorry, that every time you give it a weighted data set, a binary classification data set that's weighted, it does a little better than random coin testing, right? And it can be arbitrarily, you know, small, how much better it does. Then I just get my step size, and I just add this classifier to my H, and that's it. And there's one more thing I have to add, uh, recompute my weights. If you think about this, it's very, very simple. It's just, I just, you know, if you remember, uh, the weight was actually just uh, defined as follows. The weight was this term here. So it's just e to the minus h times y, so it's just the, the loss of this particular data point. So now because we added alpha h to it, we also have to add this in the exponent. So we just multiply w with this term. Okay, so my w now gets basically my old w times this term. And if you, this is actually very important. What does this mean? Alpha h times y is either plus one or is negative one, right? Because both of these are either plus one or mi minus one. So if this here is, if h of xi agrees with yi, so my little, my weak learner gets this point correct, what happens? Then this here is just one, right? It's one times one, or minus one times minus one, it's also one, right? Then what I'm doing is I take this weight that I have and I multiply it with e to the minus alpha. What is e to the minus alpha? It's pretty small. Okay, it's a small number because alpha is my step size. e to the minus something is small. So what I'm doing is I make my weight a lot smaller. If I get this point wrong, h and y doesn't, do not agree in sign, then this here is minus one. <laughs> minus minus is positive, so I get e to the alpha. So this means I take my weight and I multiply it by e to the alpha. So it gets larger, right? And so if you do this repeatedly, if you get a point wrong a couple times in a row, every time you multiply with e to the alpha, right? So it's, you know, alpha can change, but so basically this is an exponential growth in weight and the other one, you know, has an exponential decrease in weight. So what happens if you get a point wrong, basically it, it ink, the weight gets so large, right? that eventually the entire data set will just consist of this one point, right? It's just like, get this one point right, right? And the next week learner will get it right eventually. And that's the magic of the other boost, right? So it basically always focuses on the data point that you can still get it wrong, and just assigns more weights to it. And because it's so aggressive with the weighting, it converges very quickly. Can anyone tell me a downside of this? Yeah? If you have a noisy data, that's exactly right. So if you have a mislabeled data point, right? So let's say, you know, you class, you have your data said everything is fine, but one point you just accidentally flip the label, right? Adaboost will not be able to look past it, right? It will just get that, it will make the entire decision boundary go all the way into that region, right? And, and get the rescue that one point. Right? So that, that's, that's an inherent limitation of Adaboost. If you have noisy data, you know, this is, uh, it's not the right algorithm, right? But if you have, if you trust your labels, Adaboos can be an amazing algorithm. And it works really, really, really well. <clears throat> All right, and down here we develop, we divide by this term, two epsilon, one minus epsilon. And so, again, I'm not going through the derivation here, but it's actually very easy to show that that's actually the normalization. So if you sum over all, that's exactly the loss. So you sum over all the weights that actually has exactly this term here. So you don't even have to do that, right? Any questions? So the pseudocode is really just, you know, these, these five steps here, right? You call your weighted, your, your algorithm to get with a weighted data set, you compute your error, compute the step size, add it to your classifier, reweight the data points, repeat, right? And that's what, you, well, that's what you're doing. Oh, for regressions, you cannot do other boost with regression. Oh, okay. No, there's no such thing. Then you have to do regression boost. I mean, the other boosting algorithm can do it, but the adaptive boosting does not work. Yeah, good question. Okay, any more questions? All right, and um, finally, let me just go over one last beautiful. That's this kind of the last thing. If, you, if you're not convinced yet that other boost is the most beautiful thing you've ever laid your eyes on. 
Here comes the last thing that will convince you. It's going to blow you away. Uh, can you take it? All right. Wait, it's not here. Where is it? <laughs> um, oh, I haven't. Where's my proof? One second. Um, no problem. Oh, shoot, I stashed my git changes. Oh, this is a git error. All right, that's, that's horrible. Um, all right, I will, get, I will recover this. Um, sorry about this. You, you won't see the most beautiful thing you've ever laid your eyes on. Um, <laughs> but I can. <laughs> that's really bizarre. I see. OK, so I guess I had a conflict with my TAs. On Git. See, that the Git sucks. Sorry. So just, Git is horrible. <laughs> I mean, it's great for code, but it's horrible for lecture notes. Okay. So here's, here's let, me just, let me just tell you. Let me just tell you uh, why I, th okay, let me just close this. I have to tell you this last thing. Yeah, okay, it's here. Huh. Okay. Um, so, in, in the notes, so it's not here right now, but the moment I will recover my Git mishap, I, I, it will be back, back on the notes. Um, it's easy to show two things. So the loss of a classifier is sum over i e to the uh, minus y i h of x i. Okay? And the error of a classifier, the training error, is the following. It's, let's call this error of h equals sum over i equals 1 to n Delta h of x i does not equal y i. But this is either 1 if that's the case and 0 otherwise. Now, I'll give you a minute. Try to prove to me that this here is an upper bound of that. So I'm claiming the loss is always larger than your error. Right? So maybe you spend a minute, you and your neighbor, try to prove it. It's a one line proof. Half a line in Julia. <coughs> All right, who has a suggestion? How do we prove it? Yeah? Uh, the maximum the error can be is n. The maximum the error can be is n. OK, that's right. And the maximum the loss can be is uh, e to the 1 plus e to the 1 and 1 and n times. So that's true. That's true. The maximum is larger here. So left hand side is n times e and right hand side is n. Uh, but I guess in the, 
so that's basically in the worst case. The, the loss can be much larger, but the question is, can the loss also be lower? Right? Could it be that the loss is ever lower? So the, the max, that's true, you're totally right. But I want to show that actually on every possible case, like even not at the maximum, this must be larger. Yeah. Uh, the right hand side is just doing the X and the left hand side is. Um. Yeah, you, you're going the right direction, that's right. So, so uh, yeah, so, so you, have, you have exactly the right thing. So, basically, there's two cases. Let me just write down that. There's two cases for any X and Y. First case, um, H of XI equals YI. Right, so they're basically positive. And this here is E to the minus. In this case, they match, so it's just e to the minus h of xi, I guess. Um, well, I guess the po you know, positive value here. And on the right-hand side, if they're, that's 0, right? So no matter what this is up here, this is always greater or equal 0, right? So if they're correct, this delta term is 0. Well, e to the something is always greater or equal 0, so, so we are fine, right? So for all the points that are, that are correctly classified, we are fine. Second case is h of xi does not equal y. Right? Well, in this case, this here equals 1. And this here equals e to the something positive. Right? So h of xi, right? Well, that's actually, you know, e to the 0 is 1. e to the anything positive must, positive must be greater than 1. Right? So again, the left-hand side is greater than the right-hand side. All right? So in every case, we are always greater than the right-hand side. So the loss is always greater or equal than, than the error. All right? So that's great, because we are driving down the loss very, very quickly, and therefore we must be driving down the training error. Right? So we know certainly, and here comes the cool thing, we know that the moment the loss is less than 1, we can't have a single training point, training error anymore. Right? So if this is less than 1, this must be less than 1, so it must be 0, right? Because the smallest it can be, is you get one point wrong. And so, now, if you look at the, these notes, which will be online this afternoon, um, it's very easy to show, it's like five steps, that I'm just not going through right now, because it's, not, it's easy, but not very exciting. Um, that the loss, actually, the loss is bounded above by n times 1 minus 4 some terms gamma squared to the t over 2. So <coughs> what is this? This doesn't matter. This here is a very small number. So this here is less than 1. It's a positive number less than 1 to the power of t. t is the number of iterations you boost. So loss goes down exponentially with the number of iterations you boost. So it goes to 0 very, very quickly. right? So every time basically comes, comes slower by that factor, right? every single time. Right? You multiply by, by some number that's less than, than 1. So it must be less than, than 1 after a finite number of steps. In fact, if you solve this and you say, when is that less than 1, right? you could solve this. And what you get is that after t is you know, log n, after log n steps. So basically after log n steps, because the loss is less than some term that goes down exponentially. So this term here looks like this. Right? It goes down very, very quickly. This here on the right-hand side. The loss is lower than that term, and the error is even lower than that term. Now, because this here is very quickly less than 1, the loss must be less than 1, and the error must be less than 1. That means we can't get a single point wrong anymore. And that happens after log n steps. So log n step is not very much, it's tiny, right? So if you burst boost after, after a couple of iterations, you will have no more training error. And there's a guarantee, right? It will always happen. And that's the amazing thing. That's, that's the people kind of blew their minds when they first saw this. Yeah? Uh, just a random question. Is there any benefit to running the Oedipus boost when you already got the training error down to zero? Yes, there is. Yes, there is. Because, um, it's a good question, actually. It's a very good question. But uh, actually what you're doing is you're minimizing the loss. And by minimizing the loss, what are you doing? You are still increasing age. Like, basically after a finite number, like after you know, log n steps, 
you will have that the signs here are correct. So everything is on the right side. But then what will happen? What are you doing next, right? You're pushing the points that are closest to the decision boundary further away, right? And so that's what you're doing. You're building a margin. So adder boost actually becomes a large margin classifier. It took people years to figure this out, actually. Like people, at the beginning, people had exactly this. Like you stop and you have zero training error. Because people hadn't, didn't, hadn't discovered the large margin thing. As only when SVMs came along with a large margin, then you know, people kind of realized, oh, that's exactly why adder boost keeps lowering the test error even after you have zero training error. People thought the moment you have zero training error, stop boosting because you're starting to overfit. But actually, it's the opposite. You're, you're widening the margin, so you actually get a better generalization. Yeah? How does minimizing the loss increase the margin if the loss is already zero? The loss will not, never be zero. The loss, this is, e to the something will never be zero, only in the limit. If you get them all right, the loss is going to change at a certain point. No, no, no. It will keep going down. Right, the loss basically is e to the, think about it, e to the, e to the minus yi h of xi. If this is my decision boundary, you have a point really close by, right? This here has the right label. So this is e to the minus something, this is small. But if I move this point further away, so if I move the decision boundary further away from the point, this will be even larger, so the loss will be even smaller. So h isn't 0 or 1? Oh, yeah, sorry. h is the sum of many alpha times 0 and 1s. Yeah, yeah, very good point. Very good clarification. That's right. right? Each one of the little h's is plus 1 or minus 1. But h actually can be, can be a, is, is a real number. Yeah, very good point. Otherwise, you're right. Thank, thanks for asking that. Yeah. Any other questions? OK, last, last chance. So OK, what I handed out is a, so people ask for more practice questions. So what I gave you is a practice question. So um, I thought, instead of doing this in class now, you can do it at home and see this preparation for the exam. And so what I did here is basically I started out with a data set the blue plus pluses and red minuses. And at the beginning, everything has a weight of 1 minus n. And then you've got the first classifiers. That's basically this, this, horizontal, this vertical line on the left-hand side. They divided in positive and negative. Now you see some points are misclassified. These three little circles are misclassified. And what you're supposed to do in every single round, you're supposed to compute the error. So there's epsilon 1 and green below it. And you're supposed to compute the step size. And you're supposed to compute the weight for every single point. And then you can do the next iteration. The next iteration, then we found the next classifier, which is another vertical line. That's an iteration two. In the center, you, the, the left-hand side is the first classifier, and the middle one is the second classifier. And then again, please compute the error and the step size. And then comes the third classifier in iteration three, that's on the very right. And so if you keep computing these, then at the end, basically, you get the final classifier, and you see every single point is correct. Right? So, but if you walk through the motion, it should become very, very clear in your head what's going on. Any questions about this problem set and what to do? Yeah? So should we always run for an odd number of steps so we don't have any uh, zero points? Uh, in our age? Like, so age of uh, the point is never... Oh, I see. It's never... <laughs> that's, uh, that I mean, actually, because you're waiting by alpha, it could actually, it could actually happen at any time. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, I see. Once you have a training, so actually, it's a very good question. He's asking, once you reach the point of training, zero training error, don't you just move around that point, right? Actually, be, be careful. This here is not the point of, of zero training error. This here is the point of uh, the minimum loss. Right, so you basically get, in this case, actually, other boost is actually really far away. Right? You don't get there. Like, or at least the step size gets smaller and smaller. Alpha will get really, really small at some point. You're just creeping up to this. It could be that here already you have zero training error. Yeah. <clears throat> OK, any more questions? All right. Um, if that is the case, then we can now finally, I can answer your, your calls, and we get to deep learning. And so one, I quickly have to apologize. Today you will not get deep learning, you will not get printed notes. 
because I'm actually rewriting that part of the class. So the last one thing you don't know is the last nine years, um, everybody always got handwritten notes. <coughs> so you're just only getting it in the very last lecture. <coughs> so once, uh, because deep learning changed so quickly, um, it, it's, I don't want to use last year's notes for this. If you can't read my handwriting, you're not alone. All right, so a lot of you have probably already heard of deep learning and neural networks. And actually, before I get there, I remembered something I want to mention. So last time, last time I had lunch with students, someone asked me about, uh, I posted some demo of some bike demo of the other GP. There's two GPs. One is Gaussian processes, the other one is genetic programming. And so, um, so someone asked, you know, are we covering genetic programming or evolutionary programming? And the answer is no, absolutely not. Um, and I just want to maybe give a two minute explanation. So um, genetic programming is something that's very popular and it's probably also something that a lot of you have heard of. And it, it's um, like, you know, the random forest is kind of always the second best algorithm. Genetic programming is almost always the worst algorithm that still kind of works. <laughs> and it, it's, it's kind of like the Bud Light, right? The Bud Light of <laughs> machine learning algorithms. <laughs> and and, and it, actually, that analogy actually works pretty well because, you know, you're wondering, like, why do people drink Bud Light? It's a terrible beer, right? Why, why, why is that happening? And because it's like, because of marketing, right? I guess, right? Like, people, everybody knows it, so it's like, oh, why not, right? I guess sometimes you're in a situation where you just have no other choice. <laughs> and um, genetic programming is similar. So it should have died out a long time ago, right? It's really a terrible algorithm. Like, it doesn't make a lot of sense. And it, um, my, my personal explanation is basically it was invented by people. Like, machine learning is really an intersection of statistics, computer science, optimization theory, information theory. And sometimes people reinvent things that, you know, because they don't talk to other fields. So something, for example, fuzzy logic or something like this, right? Where basically people who are very familiar with logic try to incorporate uncertainties. And they, you know, instead of using statistics, like you're asked, talking to statisticians who had like, you know, decades of experience with, you know, dealing with uncertainties, they kind of came up with their own way of doing logic with uncertainties and it didn't really work. Uh, nowadays, nobody really works, or very few people work on fuzzy logic. And so genetic programming is similar, right? So some people who basically didn't really embrace optimization theory, which is really its own field and has very smart people working on it, kind of came up with this idea. And the idea is not bad, right? So it's basically inspired by evolution. So the idea in some sense is you try to minimize a function, but I don't really know what that function is, so I can't take gradients or something. So what I do is I try out some points and I get a function value. Try some other points, get some function value points here. And then I basically say, okay, well, let's mix, mix these points up. So I know this one does pretty well. So let me basically kind of say, well, these two now, you know, get married and have offspring. You know, they don't have to get married, actually. It's a little old-fashioned. But uh, <laughs> you, you, you see what I'm, you know. <laughs> and so um, then basically you say, okay, well, let's just try out some random points around here, basically, right? Um, that, that's a terrible way of doing it. Or, I'm trying not to judge. Okay, that's a <laughs> suboptimal way of doing it. Because 
Because you're not taking any information into account, right? So basically what you're not doing is you're not taking into account, well, here's a direction, right? That's very, very interesting, right? And so maybe if I follow that direction, it goes, keeps going down, right? So what Gaussian processes, for example, do is they would fit a line around this, say, here I'm really uncertain, right? So maybe I should explore something down here, right? Uh, that's very informed. That takes a lot of second order information about these points into account, et cetera. So genetic program doesn't do any of this, right? So because of this, it also has no convergence guarantees. Well, it has, it, it, it converges, but, you know, occasionally. Uh, <laughs> and um, now it doesn't mean, you know, it doesn't work at all, right? So sometimes all you need is some reasonable, you know, solution of your function. And so it works. It's just never the, or it, I've never encountered a single setting where that is the right algorithm to use or the optimal algorithm to use. Right? And the reason it's still very popular is because, at least that's my explanation, is that it's very intuitive, right? And it has this very cool name, like genetic programming. Like it's a branding, it's like Bud Light, right? It's like there's always, you know, Super Bowl commercials, right? <laughs> of good looking people on the beach drinking Bud Light. And you're like, oh, that sounds pretty good, right? So it's, it's kind of like this, right? So, so we all know evolution worked really well, so why shouldn't that work well on computers, right? And, of course, computers is very, uh, function optimization in computers is completely different than evolution. So the, the, you know, in evolution, you have trillions of organisms who kind of mutate. And it never happens that they all get together and say, okay, let's do, it's now, it's kind of look at the gradient descent directions and let's all make an update. And all, everybody spread out again, all right? That right? doesn't work. It has to be completely distributed. But at the moment you have a computer, you can always kind of do some centralized update and you get a lot more information, right, if you incorporate this. Also, you don't have to be, it's not that half your organism suddenly die because a meteoroid, you know, comes in or something. Like, it, it's just a very, very different setting, right? Um, so that, that's why I don't really go into it. And if I ever find a setting where it's actually the right algorithm to, to use, then I will incorporate it in my class. But I've been saying this for many years. I've never come up with a single one, and no one has been able to show me one. Um, the demo that I posted, by the way, it's kind of cute, so I may look at it. It's on the web page. It's you know of little bikes that basically have to ride a little track, and then the one that's furthest you know has a higher chance of basically getting offspring, etc. And it looks cute, but actually, what it really shows is how how slow such an optimization problem is. Like if you just watch this twice, once or twice, you see you know that actually um, you know what the right configuration would be, but actually the algorithm really does not discover it. Um, it's still a cute demo, and it was actually, it was in fact written by a high school student, right? And that in some sense shows it, right? Like it's, 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 like it's, it's awesome, right? The high school student did a really good job at implementing that genetic programming demo. And so it's really also the kind of thing that you can do when you're in high school, right? So you don't need a stats degree, you don't need something to know something about optimization theory. But if you do, then um, I, I think it's not particularly interesting. So anyway, I just want to say this because I know there's always, every year there's a lot of people who want to know about genetic programs. And I, um, that's kind of all I give it. Any questions? All right, good, neural networks. So neural networks also have a branding problem. And just quickly, neural networks were invented at Cornell University um, by Frank Rosenblatt in 1963, I believe. Uh, and he did, back then didn't call it neural networks. He called it multi-layer perceptron. So it's also called multi-layer perceptron. Or as of a few years ago, it's called deep learning. It's all essentially the same thing. So it's actually literally the same thing. <clears throat> um, multi-layer perceptron was, I guess, the original name. You know, perceptron got a little bit of a, it has been, it has been renamed a couple of times. Perceptron got a little bit of a bad rap because of it's, you know, um, because of the AI winter. When it was renamed to neural networks, that was really, here there was a big brain inspiration. And, and when it first came out, people thought that new artificial neural networks are doing something that's similar to the brain. Um, that's really not really the case. I know it, it's, if you squint and look at a very tiny brain, maybe that's the case. But, um, there's still a lot of, lot of things that are different. If you, you know, um, and, and that makes a lot of sense because the hardware is very, very different. And in fact, actually, a lot, of, um, a lot of inspiration that came from the brain, where people thought, oh, this is how the brain does it, so maybe you should do this on computers. 
ultimately, I think they are mostly distractions, to be honest. Like, it's rare that I, there's anything of any of these leads have followed up. Um, neural networks were very popular in the 80s. So in the 1980s, machine learning was, um, there was basically two approaches to machine learning, logic-based machine learning, that was, and neural networks-based machine learning. And in fact, the people who did logic-based machine learning, they did not recognize neural networks as a proper thing, and they did not accept them at their conferences. And so the people who did neural networks got mad, and they started their own conference. It's called Neural Information Processing Systems. And that's today actually the number one conference in machine learning. <laughs> um, and so that actually, that conference became very popular and there was a lot of papers on neural networks and, you know, became very, very popular. Until the 90s, late 90s, when SVMs came around. And people just fell in love with SVMs, right? They were so beautiful. And so then people, you know, like the SVM so much, there were more and more SVM's paper, SVM paper. And until actually in some, at some point, 2002 or 2003, it happened, there was not a single neural network paper anymore at NIPS, the conference on neural, uh, neural networks. And in fact, every single paper that had neural networks then got, started getting rejected. So in fact, there was a new generation of students and they basically thought neural networks are just stupid, right? That's the old way of doing it. The new way of doing it is SVM's. And it uh, got so bad, that um, hardly anyone did neural networks anymore. And uh, there were three people who held on to it very much, like Jeff Hinton, Jan Lecon, and uh, Joshua Bengio, the three professors from NYU, Toronto, and Montreal. And at some point they got together one night, this was in 19, 2006, and they got together over a glass of wine, they kind of all chatting about you know, how frustrating it is that all their papers get rejected just because they have the word neural networks in it. And like students just reject it because, like reviewers just reject it just because they mention the word neural networks. And then one of them had the idea, well, why don't we just stop saying neural networks, right? We just, we just don't, we don't say it. I was like, well, what, what should we say? I mean, it's just that, well, we just call it deep learning. And why deep learning? Because then everything else is shallow learning. <laughs> and that, that is literally what happened. <laughs> and so they wrote papers and they just changed you know, you, know, re you know, replace all, right? Like neural networks to deep learning. <laughs> <sighs> deep network. And suddenly the papers got accepted because people were like, well, what is this deep learning? Oh, it's interesting. Yeah, interesting stuff. <laughs> <laughs> and, um, you know, a lot of people are interested. And now actually people say, oh, this is the new machine learning. It's deep learning. <laughs> so, um, well, so, <laughs> but really, like, you know, conceptually, not much has changed. All right, let me... Um, let me tell you the basics. So, it's actually very related to kernels. Now, you, you will see why people fell in love with kernels. So, it's kind of the way I'm explaining it is kind of upside down, right? Like history upside down. So, I'm starting with kernels and then I tell you how to make neural networks out of it. So, in kernels, we had linear classifiers. H of x equals w transpose x. And we said that's just a linear classifier. That's too simple, right? That's the same problem that Rosenblatt had here at Cornell back when he invented the perceptron. So, the solution of kernels was, well, why don't we just have some function phi of x, we map our x into a very high dimensional space, and in that space, you know, now we have a lot more expressive power, and that, you know, that linear decision boundary now becomes a lot more powerful, and actually becomes a nonlinear decision boundary in the original space. And so the way kernels did this is they had a very, very well-crafted um, functions, such that the inner products of these functions are computed, it can be computed in closed form. So we don't actually have to do this mapping. That's awesome, right? Because you have to do this mapping implicitly, and um, it's very, very fast, but it's restrictive, right? Because you can only pick functions such that you actually know how to compute that in a product. Like, for example, the RBF kernel, the polynomial kernel. Now, <clears throat> what deep learning does, what neural networks do, is they say, Instead of actually making, making a handcrafted function like the RBF uh, kernel or something, what we do is we make phi of x just a parameterized function. So we just actually learn that function. And so in, in neural networks, what we say is phi of x equals the following, equals sigma of a of x plus b. Where a is just a matrix. So I just take my x, multiply by a matrix, and then add a constant to it. Right? So basically, what are you doing, right? If you multiply by a matrix, it's an affine transformation. So you take your data, you kind of stretch it, right? You stretch 
arbitrary directions and other directions you shrink. Right? So you, you kind of, it's like your, your, your data set is kind of you know, made out of rubber or something, right? your space, and you, you, you pull it. And then you have this sigma here. And what is that sigma? That sigma is some nonlinear function. <clears throat> and uh, for a long time, what people had here is sigma is the sigmoid function. That's why it's still called sigma often. The sigma is a sigmoid, you know that from logistic regression, um, is 1 over 1 plus e to the minus z. So <clears throat> that was at least what Jeff Hinton used in, 19, you know, in the 80s. And he, um, that caught on. And if you remember what that function looks like, it looks like this. Right? So it's basically, if z is very, very negative, it becomes a 0. And then it goes up to 1 half. And then if it becomes very, very positive, it goes to 1. And, <clears throat> and you apply this function to every, this here is a vector, right? So x times matrix is a vector. And you apply this to every single dimension. And so the, the inspiration in some sense was, this is like the brain, right? Where neurons basically get some input and they either switched on or switched off. So basically what your vector becomes is either ones or zeros essentially, right? So either you have a large value, then you have a one, or you have a small value, you have a zero. So you basically take your input, you map it into some different space of zeros and ones. <clears throat> but for different inputs, they are different, right? So you basically you switch them on or off. Um, <clears throat> and everybody used this actually for 20 years, sigmoid function. And then actually, Jeff Hinton, who was one of the people who introduced it, just a few years ago, was like, um, actually, don't use the sigmoid function. Right? Sigmoid function is terrible. Um, I remember why we introduced it. And uh, I remember when we introduced it. And we didn't really have a good reason to use the sigmoid function. And actually, it has big disadvantages when we optimize it. So what people nowadays do is actually something much, much simpler. So they just use the max for 0. That's called a rectified linear unit. So that looks like this. And I'm going to explain to you in a minute why, why one is much better than the other. <clears throat> so it turns out you need some nonlinear function here. So <clears throat> far of x just is a, basically an affine transformation. You take your input, you multiply by the matrix, you add some constant, and then you have some, some nonlinear function here. But you basically, in this case, nowadays, you just take all the negative values and set them to zero. Uh, and so if you didn't have this, then actually it would just become a linear classifier. Right, that's easy to show. If you didn't have this, then if, you, if sigma was actually not there, then we would just have W transpose AX plus B. Well, that just becomes W transpose A X plus W transpose B, where this here is another vector, W hat. W hat transpose X plus this here is my b, b hat. All right, so if, if you just have a transformation without the sigma, then actually multiplying by a vector is the same thing as if you would just learn a different vector. So you still actually just have a linear classifier. So <clears throat> the trick of neural networks is you have some affine transformation, which is very, very general here. Right? It's just a multiplication with a matrix. That's it. And then you just have some very simple function that just sets everything that's negative to zero. And that's all that's going on. Um, and when you learn it, you basically learn W, and you learn A, and you learn B at the same time. Uh, next lecture, we will uh, tell you a lot more about this. And we get into all the details. And I show you a, a ton of demos, actually. <clears throat> Quick question.